Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, is that the Barnetts are in the house? Or at least one of the Barnett, a Barnett, ba, ba's in the house. Welcome to our Sunday plenary luncheon. Uh, to kick off this session, I'm gonna be moderating a panel discussion on using climate data for better city planning and enhanced resiliency. With support from AT&T, we will explore how mayors can address climate-related disasters using data and new digital tools, including the Climate Risk and Resilience Portal, CLIMRR, which was developed by the Center for Climate Resilience and Decision Science at Argonne National Laboratory in collaboration with AT&T and the United States Department of Homeland Security, federal agency, federal, sorry, federal emergency management agency known to all of you, of course, as FEMA. Uh, many have heard me talk about Miami's vulnerabilities and increasingly strong storms and flooding. For our panel, we're gonna welcome today Tacoma Mayor, uh, a city which is experiencing extreme weather in different ways, nearby wildfires and potential for drought. Under her leadership, Tacoma has worked to create a comprehensive adoptive climate action plan. Also joining us this afternoon is the Director of the Resilience Analysis and Capacity Development Division of the Risk Management Directorate of the Federal Disaster. Blah, 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 blah. Well, that's a serious line there. You're gonna, let me start back, let's start again. Wait, I want, I want you guys to stick with me on this. Hang tight, hang tight. Also joining us this afternoon is the Director of the Resilience Analysis and Capacity Development Division of the Risk Management Directorate of the Federal Disaster Management Agency. Wow, I didn't know that a department could be, it could have a name that long. Lastly, we are joined by the assistant. You get better at this the more you do it, right, right, right? Right, Brian? Okay. We're joined by the assistant vice president of environmental sustain sustainability at AT&T. So let's get started. Please welcome to the stage Tacoma Mayor Victoria Woodards, <laughs> Director Karen Marsh, and AT&T Shannon Carroll. Director. Now, before we get started, Director, I want you to say the name of your department three times fast. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, let's start with you, Mayor Woodard. Um, who pronounces your name better, me or my daughter? Your daughter. Okay, I, I, I think so. Actually, your daughter pronounces my name better than most adults. <laughs> than most adults. So can you tell us a little bit about what the city of Tacoma has seen as it relates to challenges brought on by extreme weather and what future climate threats you're gonna see and you're seeing on the horizon? Well, we are, not, we are not unlike most cities in America who are facing some issues regarding climate change. As I say, climate change is real. And I will tell you, in a city like Tacoma, there are a couple things that we're seeing. Um, one is we're seeing um, sea level rise and storm surges yeah. in our city. Did um, for us. And, 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 and actually, um, we just saw um, up to two feet higher by mid-century. That's what, we're, that's wow. what we think we're gonna, going to be seeing. And honestly, we actually experienced some of that on December 27th. We had an unusual king tide and storm event that certainly worried our, worried our port. And that's big business for us, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got to make sure that we're keeping um, them safe. But, um, and then we're also, it, this might surprise people. Some people go, doesn't that happen anyway? But we're seeing more severe rainfall. Yes, so, so um, are we. And, and everybody thinks in Washington, well, that's that's just normal. But we call them rain bombs. The, <laughs> we do. Now, see, we do bombs. real rain bombs. Yeah, we don't have rain, rain bombs. bombs. We just have rain a lot. Okay. Um, and it's really stretching our systems in some areas. Um, we thank goodness for Tacoma. We have a separate um, storm and sewer, but it's also still bringing more localized flooding. Um, I will also say that we're also having a heat dome issue. Tacoma's not known. Washington State, or at least at least this side of the mountains, you know, the west side that we live on, is not known for heat. And so we know that in the heat dome of 2021, in June of 2021, eight Tacomans lost their lives. Oh no! Due to heat in our city. Um, and, and the numbers say that um, in addition to what happened in Tacoma, over 200, up to over 250 people in the state of Washington lost their lives wow. to, to the heat struggles that were happening. And, so, and then the final issue that we'll talk about, that I'll talk about is um, wildfire smoke. Um, we don't have wildfires in the city of Tacoma, 
but we're experiencing wildfire smoke from eastern Washington, from California. Um, so our city is being hit with that as well. Wow. So I know that you have a climate action plan. Yep. And it's obviously adaptation based. What kind of adaptation or mitigation, uh, you know, things are you putting into place right. uh, to deal with the things that you're already seeing? Well, a couple of things. So, so I, I spoke, um, you know, about you, or you spoke about our climate action plan. We are in our third climate action plan, um, and it really is focused on having. Uh, we set a really aggressive uh, carbon pollution reduction targets by 2025. By 2050, geez, 202050. Where is that at? Um, but by 2050, and so we're really focused on implementing the plan. And the plan just is. It's about climate change, but it's also about a better. Tacoma, better health, better mobility, better jobs, better equity, and being better prepared. And so <clears throat> we're doing a couple things. Um, one is as it relates to our tree canopy. When we talk about the deaths that have happened in our city, a lot of it is because we don't, we, we found to be the city in Washington with the least amount of tree canopy. So we have an aggressive goal of increasing our tree canopy by 30% to make sure that we're, we're being able to give people the shade that they need. Um, we are also, um, we have innovative heat pump rebates and loans, including for rental properties, because a lot of times those opportunities are yep. only offered to owners. Sure. And so, so we've got that as well. And then for those who can't have access um, to heat pumps or cooling for homes, we actually have grants that we have given to our health department that they actually hand out uh, filter fans to our most vulnerable members of our community. So those are just a few things that we're focused on. Woo. Yeah. That's all? That's all. That's all, right. all. And that isn't even the whole So list. this question is for Shannon. Can you talk about how extreme weather events affect AT&T and the communities you serve and what actions you're taking to address these risks? Absolutely. The, the equation on that's pretty easy for us in terms of the importance of... Can't hear you, change. Shannon. Speak Let's go. up. That's right, coffee, right. let's go. Okay, let's go. Oh, there you go. So, uh, but they missed my, my, my music that I requested to come on, so. You know. <laughs> there you go. No, but so for us, the equation is really easy at AT&T. We have a significant infrastructure, network infrastructure in the ground, and obviously extreme weather events um, threaten that. And if it threatens our infrastructure, that means it impairs our ability potentially to service our customers. So that is extraordinarily important for us because at the end of the day, we're a connectivity company. We want to connect all of our customers, um, including our first responders, first net alike. So this journey has really started for us around 2016. And although I try to tell people all the time I'm a climate scientist, I'm not. And so we actually work with Argonne National Labs to get the best available cli climate science. And that's really important because if you're going to ask network engineers to potentially redesign a network, you better have really good, real, credible data, and, and we have that um, with the Argon data. And for us, we really started on what we just call a pilot, right? So four states within the southeast. We wanted to make sure that you know we could execute on what we were trying to do. I'm happy to report that you know we were, we were able to execute, and we actually expanded it to 48 states now. So within our 48 state footprint, um, the lower 48, we actually have the ability to look at extreme uh, extreme uh, extreme weather events, including wildfire, coastal flooding, inland flooding, drought, ex extreme winds. So all those are, are really important because our, our network, again, can be susceptible to that. So what does all that mean, though, right? It means that we take that data and we use it um, as we look at our network in two particular ways. So one, we're able to perform climate risk assessments on the in infrastructure that we have in the ground today, right? So is there a central office that is going to have flooding that we didn't know based on historical events? And if there is, we can put the floodgate up. Is there, um, and so that's, that's just one example. I'll give you some more examples as we go. But maybe more importantly, what we do is we design the network of the future, the network of tomorrow, including FirstNet. We are now able to provide climate risk scores to all of our network engineers. So as they're designing and planning that network, they have information that can help them plan that, that better. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is it was really important for us to make all this data publicly available. When we started our journey, the number one challenge we had is finding actionable climate data, neighborhood level climate data. We've been able to get our hands on that and we just made a decision really early to put that in the public domain. Um, and really that decision has ultimately led to Climber, the Climber portal and why we're here today. Well, we're grateful for that because obviously the more actionable data we have, the better decision making uh, that we can have. Uh, we, we saw the devastation of Ian. We see these storms um, that are so devastating and they seem to happen frequently 
and we, of course, as a, as a country and as communities, are trying to become more and more resilient against these natural disasters. Uh, what is FEMA's approach to climate-related extreme weather events? Thank you. Well, FEMA has a strategic plan. It's a five-year strategic plan, and there are only three primary objectives in that plan. It is to ensure that FEMA is ready to respond, that we're helping communities prepare, the second is to instill equity as a foundation of emergency management. And the third is a whole community approach to climate resilience. So the first thing you have to do when you're tackling such a big challenge as climate resilience is have data, have information. And that's why this collaboration between AT&T and Argonne National Laboratory is so, so critical. This is dynamically downscaled, and believe me, I didn't know what that meant six months ago. Um, but it means that it is the most robust, most accurate, forward-looking data, and it is free to everyone. Just want to reiterate that. It is Why free to all. Free is good. <laughs> so it's through this collaboration that we're able to provide this data, um, and FEMA is also making some policy changes. So we have required that hazard mitigation plans now look to the future. That is now a requirement. Now often, sometimes we don't offer you the resources to fulfill the requirement that we put on you. So um, this, is, this is different. I, I, I've, heard, I've heard of those. I've heard of those before. <laughs> but this is different. So we do have the climber data to help you revise your hazard mitigation plans, also to factor into the benefit cost analysis. Yeah of your applications for FEMA grants. We're making more money available for mitigation, and we're also supporting technical assistance to help you with the consequence management aspect of these hazards as they are hitting you. So that's really the, the FEMA strategy, the FEMA approach, and it's through this collaboration that we're providing you free, did I say free? You free said free. Data. Free, free, free. You said free, you said free. free. You said something else, and then you said free. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so how do you see Klim RR, which by the way, I, if I can make a small recommendation, yes. change the name. Okay. Klim RR, I'm not sure even how to pronounce it. Well, we pronounce it Climber. Climber. There you go, Climber. <laughs> maybe if you put an so E Climber, instead of an R. Maybe a long I, a little I gas or something. <laughs> Some. Climber. Help a brother out. Uh, like somebody just put a dash on my prompter. Climb, <laughs> climb, I don't know climb, Anyways, yeah, enabling U.S. mayors and their staff to better plan for climate-related extreme weather events. So, so explain to us how the technology is going to help us. Um, so this, as I said, it's all free, and I certainly invite everyone to visit the booth and take a look at, uh, you can see a live demonstration right now to see um, what the future looks like in your community. And one thing I know about mayors I don't, I've, I've met a few in my day, and mayors are good communicators. They are charismatic, and they care about their community. So fundamentally, the bottom line is that you care about the safety of the residents and the visitors to your community. Bottom line, safety, and that is why you need to start thinking ahead, because <clears throat> these billion dollar disasters are gonna be coming. I hear concern. I hear anxiety yes. from mayors, and this is your opportunity to establish your legacy by making sure that any kind of infrastructure improvements, any buildings along the waterfront are addressing the future conditions that your community is going to face. And I can tell you, uh, as a, the, the lone mayor on the Global Council on Adaptation, which mm -hmm. is a worldwide uh, board, all the studies I've seen show for every dollar that you spend prophylactically, you save seven to eight dollars in disaster expense. So it is literally a seven to one, eight to one ratio in terms of spending on the front end to make yourselves more resilient or spending on the back end in disaster management. Uh, Mayor well, well I, can't, I can't say I'm here from the federal government without saying we're also here to help. Yes. So please, we want to work with you. That's my tagline. That's my tagline, how can I help? Um, so Mayor, tools like the ones I can't pronounce, um, how do we help achieve, how do they help you achieve uh, the needs that you see for Tacoma, and of course, particularly the most vulnerable in your city? Well, we all know um, that data is one of the most important tools that we have as, as municipalities and as mayors, and so it, it helps us, what I say, make better decisions, but we can target those decisions based on the data. 
um, in Tacoma, I'm really excited that we've put together Tacoma Equity Index, which is, allows us to use 30, 32 community indicators to determine um, what happens in every community. And so we, we're able to use that to target right. communities um, where they are lacking opportunity. Great. And so, but this data allows us to include environmental data around our tree canopy that I already talked about, pollution, and the heat islands that we talked about. We can actually target specific neighborhoods and demographics, which really allows us to use, utilize our energy in the best way. And so, and, and, and climber. <laughs> Climber. She's a better communicator than no, I am. No, I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm I, I kept saying climb RR when I was reading, but thank God you did it first. So climber. So Ed, when I get back there, Ed's gonna be like, uh, did you want me to do it phonetically for you? I mean, come on, man. <laughs> but climber is really working hand in hand with our existing data um, to really dive into the specific environmental indicators to further build out our actions on how we're gonna address um, climate change in each one of our communities. So Shannon, obviously, you know, we sort of want to wrap up with you. You know, we can we understand why you want to protect your infrastructure as AT&T, but this is going beyond protecting your infrastructure. This is creating a community asset. What motivates you and AT&T to go beyond just protecting your own self-interest and you know, obviously your own assets, and creating a tool uh, like Karen said that that is actionable, that gives you actionable data for free, for free, right? That we can all use to better plan. What, what, what motivates the company? So the first motivation is our customers, quite frankly, right? So think of a severe weather event. Think of some type of natural disaster. The first thing you do other than securing your personal safety is you're going to pick up your phone and you're going to call your family either to let them know you're okay or to make sure they're okay. Mm. So connectivity is key. We are a connectivity company, so we take that responsibility Love very that. seriously. The other thing that's important is, you know, I've said this in the past, is it, it doesn't do us any good to be climate resilient in a vacuum. Right, it immediately breaks down if all the communities that we live and work, our employees live and work, the utilities around us that help support us, it doesn't do us any good if, if everybody's not climate resilient. And that's one of the biggest motivators for getting that information out there. So from that perspective, you know, we are always thinking about you know, how, do we, how do we keep our customers connected, including our first responders through FirstNet, you know, and how do we make sure that the communities in which we serve and our employees live and work as well, how they can stay climate resilient as well. Awesome, Shannon. So this is really great, guys. Uh, I love that we can get together and uh, tie together technology and powerful tools like Climber and help our cities make better decisions with data. I want to thank each of you, Mayor Woodard. Mayor Woodard. See, that's why your daughter is better. Karen and Shannon for this great discussion today. Thank, thank you. Have you. a great day. Thank Thanks a lot. I'm gonna have dreams or nightmares about that song. Tom, just as I'm getting Tom, just as I'm getting good at this, I gotta go. I'm starting to get good at it. I'm starting to really enjoy it. And then I gotta go. Don't get too comfortable. Yeah, yeah I think Hillary's gonna be. We got a ceremony real soon to pass the gavel, right? So this meeting marks the third year in which we have welcomed a top target executive to the podium to announce the winners of our public safety grants. This grant program was created by the conference and Target to recognize and reward cities of all sizes for the policies and practices that their police departments are employing today in pursuit of protecting all people they are sworn to serve and protect. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today Target's Senior Vice President for Enterprise Risk and Government Affairs, who will announce the three winners of this third round of grants, totaling $350,000, as well as the three cities earning honorable mention for their outstanding efforts. Our presenter today has more than 20 years of experience in government affairs, having worked for members of the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate on, and on congressional and presidential campaigns. Hmm. Hmm. 
Before joining Target, he was the director of congressional, nobody got that joke. He was the director of congressional and public affairs for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where he was an advocate for issues including equity, immigration, cybersecurity, education, and more. Ladies and gentlemen, Isaac Reyes. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I mean, Mayor Suarez, it was a, appreciate you. And good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be with all of you here today, um, especially as we continue to navigate the myriad of issues that are confronting our communities and our country. But there is hope amidst the struggle, and you all represent that hope. So on behalf of everyone at Target, the members of the team that are here with us today, and that are in our stores, in our distribution centers across the country, I want to thank all of you for your commitment to leadership and public service. At Target, our culture is based on caring, growing, and winning together. It comes to life by continually investing in our team, including our frontline team members who live and work in your communities and are proud to call you neighbors. Our team is at the very heart of Target's strategy, and it's with them in mind that I would like to spend just a couple of minutes discussing a growing problem that's impacting not only our team members and guests' safety and well-being, but our communities as a whole. Organized retail crime. Organized retail crime is not petty theft. What we're dealing with are large-scale organized crime rings. All of you know, but their actions affect all of us, limiting product availability, creating a less convenient shopping experience, and putting our team and guests, your constituents, in harm's way. The unfortunate fact is that these violent incidents are increasing in our stores and across the entire retail industry. And when products are stolen, simply put, they're no longer available for our guests who depend on them. And left unchecked, organized retail crime degrades the communities we call home. Now, this is simply not a retail issue, and it can't be sick, fixed by one entity alone. And in the spirit of this conference and these grants that we're about to award today, we must tackle this growing issue through a whole of government, whole of community, and whole of industry approach. And if there's anyone who knows how to bring together these three solutions, bring these three together to find solutions and drive results, it's you. It's America's mayors. Our stores create jobs, they serve local shoppers, and they act as critical hubs in communities across the country. And we want to continue to serve these communities, your communities, our communities. This isn't just about making statements, it's about listening, it's about learning, and it's about working with partners like you and doing the work not just in community, but with community. It's gonna take our collective efforts and our best thinking and action to make vibrant communities that are safe and represent all. Which is why we at Target are so proud to support the Police Reform and Racial Justice Grant Program. This initiative aims to identify, support, and promote police policies and practices in cities that have been shown to be most effective at advancing the goal of justice for all residents. I'm so pleased on behalf of Target to announce this year's winners and invite them up here to speak about their city's programs. This year's large city grant goes to Arlington, Texas, where the grant will be used to expand their Game Up 5-0 to more youth within the city. Here to accept the grant and tell us more about the program is Arlington Mayor Jim Ross. Hey, look at that. I am so disappointed because Mayor Suarez told me I was getting the Mayor Congeniality Award today. <laughs> and, and apparently not, that it's something that I get to take credit for with what our police department did. First of all, let me thank the U.S. Conference of Mayors and Target for this generous support. Thanks to this award, the police department in Arlington will continue to be a front runner in implementing youth-focused policing strategies, building relationships of trust and providing guidance to help youth through life. Back in 2015, the Arlington Police Department created a mentoring program called Coach 5-0 to build relationships with student athletes and help improve their social and emotional well-being. Recently, the police department expanded Coach 5-0 to gaming. 
identifying a section of youth population that did not play traditional sports. To bridge this gap, the department created Game Up 5.0 to strengthen relationships with youth and the community through video games and to humanize the police badge. In 2021, the Arlington Police Department partnered with the Arlington Independent School District to host a Game Up 5.0 eSports tournament. This innovative event involved approximately 100 local students and over 30 officers. In addition to playing video games, officers use this opportunity to mentor youth on cyberbullying, stress relief, st safe places and environments, and scholarship opportunities. The department recognizes that barriers such as transportation can limit youth participation in events such as Game Up 5.0. Mobile gaming units can easily be transported to any location, making them a convenient choice for Game Up 5.0 mobile events. Gaming trucks have the advantage of accommodating multiple players, making them an excellent option for group gaming sessions, encouraging teamwork, and social interaction amongst players can be an excellent way to build trust and solve problems. This award will allow the Arlington Police Department to expand the reach of Game Up 5.0 program by bringing a mobile unit to various neighborhoods and local events such as Cooking with the Cops, Shop Talk, and National Night Out. I thank you, U.S. Conference of Mayors and Target, for this wonderful opportunity to reach the youth of our community. God bless y'all. Thank you, Mayor Ross, and congratulations. The Mid-Size City Grant is awarded to Lansing, Michigan, where grant funds are going to be used to attract skilled trade instructors to the Mikey 23 program to, assa to assist with building tasks. Here to accept the award is Lansing Mayor Andy Shore. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you to Target. Um, what a great recognition of a wonderful program. Thank you to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, in Lansing in 2015, um, we had a, a homicide. A young man named Mikey McKissick was gunned down. Uh, we still haven't found the person who did it. It's a tragedy. His father, um, he grieved, of course he would, uh, but he turned that grief into something positive. He was a, a skilled tradesman, and he started a program called Mikey 23. His son was 23 years old, where he grabbed this, the, the, the youth, especially the, the at-risk youth of the city of Lansing, and he taught them how to, to build houses. He looked around the community and said, these houses need to be fixed, we have blight. He taught them, he still teaches them how to do that. He helps them get certification and he makes sure that they don't get into trouble. He makes sure that they learn a trade, they're gonna come out of high school making a lot of money, they're gonna come out with their journey person certificate. Um, it's a great program and it helps our community. Our officers jumped in and they got involved. Our, our Lansing Police Department works alongside the youth and they foster positive interactions with this youth and build trust. Michael and, and the officers convey the importance of police and community working together to address gun violence and help their community from a young age. The foundation is also directly involved with families who've been impacted by gun violence and help to support them both emotionally and through the program with opportunities. Um, the community has embraced the program. You see residents just walk over and, and provide drink and food wherever these uh, youth are fixing houses. His motto, which I love, is instead of picking up a gun, pick up a hammer. So I want to thank Target. I want to thank the U.S. Conference of Mayors because this, this award is going to help us make sure that so many youth in Lansing pick up a hammer instead of a gun. Thank you very much. And finally, the small city category recipient is Huntington, West Virginia, where they're going to use the grant to purchase a vehicle and other equipment for their crisis intervention team. Here to accept the grant and tell us more about the program is Mayor Steve Williams.
Thank you so very much to Target for, 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 for this award, and particularly thank you for the U.S. Conference of Mayors for recognizing small cities in these. We don't find ourselves lost in the shuffle of the much larger cities. Um, and when I see what Arlington is doing and Lansing is doing, the one thing that I, we all can agree upon Cities are the laboratories of innovation throughout our nation. And if cities are the laboratories of, in of innovation, then small towns, small cities, are the petri dishes. And this is the opportunity that, that we absolutely do have here. Uh, we can be the pilot projects to be able to identify what works what doesn't, and how to fix it. As I like to say, we will identify in a small city faster what works, quicker what doesn't, and sooner how to fix it. As a result of that, we can scale different projects and be able to take them forward. That's where law enforcement assisted diversion started in Seattle, but also through uh, small towns across, uh, smaller towns across the country. Quick response teams, that we found that as a result of having to deal with the opioid crisis, we're able to be started in our community and other small cities to be able to move forward. Well, the crisis intervention team is a response to the problems that, that we are having. Police reform does not mean defunding the police. Police reform means that we identify innovative ways to be able to move ourselves forward. And what I'm so proud of with our team, with the Huntington Police Department, with our entire community in the crisis intervention team is we have 25 separate partners that we work with to be able to address homelessness, mental illness, substance use disorder. Homelessness is not a crime. Mental illness is not a crime. Therefore, what we need to assure is that we are training our police officers and providing the skills to de-escalate whenever there is an issue that is coming up regarding mental illness and be aiming, being able to, to respond. We're so very, very proud of what our police officers are able to do and everything that they have been uh, charged with the responsibility of doing. The U.S. Conference of Mayors always gives us this opportunity. And we're awfully proud that somehow Huntington, in it, as a small city, has become known as a city of solutions. The crisis intervention team is just one more notch that we're going to be utilizing as a result of the support of the Conference of Mayors and Target. Thank you so very much. <laughs>
At our 91st winter meeting in January, the San Antonio Mayor, Chair of our Mayors and Business Leaders Center for Compassion and Equitable Cities, made an announcement. He said that development of a six-part campaign designed to promote compassion and community healing was underway in his city and that it would be released for no-cost distribution to all cities at the conference's 91st annual meeting right here in Columbus. He's a man of his word, and it's my pleasure to introduce him today for the national rollout of Compassionate USA, a campaign to help decrease violence and trauma and increase individual and collective healing in all our cities. Please welcome San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg. By the way, I can honestly say he's, he's definitely more fit than I am. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. And um, can we get another round of applause for Target Corp and the Target team for all the great work they continue to do in our police reform initiative? Mayors, civic leaders, and friends, we're here today to present an earnest and honest remedy to the political polarization, civil discord, racialized violence, and the far-reaching impacts of a global pandemic. The tragedy that struck just 80 miles away from our city of San Antonio in Uvalde, Texas, exacerbated the need for both urgent and drastic change. The following U.S. Conference of Mayors annual meeting was painfully colored by the recent horrors. But our convening afforded leaders across the country to engage in conversations to guide our country toward a more compassionate path. Now I can tell you as chair of the Mayors and Business Leaders Center for Compassionate and Equitable Cities here at this conference, I, and I'm sure many of you, returned home determined to be a catalyst for change and for progress. Local conversations with my family, friends, and colleagues resulted in a bright vision and collaborative effort between the City of San Antonio and the Alamo Colleges District and our greater community to provide a true and, and permanent foundation for compassion. And today, together, we are proudly launching Compassionate USA, which will continue our spirit of collaboration to build and demand a brighter future for our nation. The concept of compassion is rooted in the golden rule to treat all others in the ways we wish to be treated. It's an ethic that has existed in some way, shape, or form in every tradition or culture that humanity has created, a testament to our collective understanding that compassion is the basis to heal our suffering. Roughly 160 days have passed in this year, 2023, yet our nation has faced well over 200 mass shootings. Think about that for a second. We are currently averaging well more than one mass shooting a day in this nation. If more guns, more weapons, and more violence were the appropriate responses to such a gruesome plague, the United States would have been the safest country on the planet a long time ago. And I think that many in this room would agree then that exhibiting compassion and care in the face of such atrocities is the epitome of strength. We can stand strong together against this needlessly protracted suffering by simply learning how to better care for one another. Because the COVID-19 pandemic unequivocally worsened our collective mental health, isolation, loneliness, job loss, financial instability, illness, and grief have taken their toll. Today, 90% of American adults believe our country is facing a mental health crisis. Though it may seem basic, a systemic foundation of compassion is desperately needed in order to physically and emotionally heal as a nation. And we know that the educational system continues to experience significant disruptions. Hundreds of thousands of students never return to school. These young minds and lives are largely unaccounted for and tragically at risk. It's incumbent upon us, many of whom lead the largest concentrated populations in the world to leave a legacy of compassion. It's in our DNA. There is truly no argument against exuding compassion throughout our communities. And now that we've discussed the why of Compassionate USA, it's time for the what. What next? What can we do? What should we do to make our communities more caring? 
Here's a glimpse of what San Antonio is gifting to the U.S. Conference of Mayors today. Our collective survival has depended upon mutual aid that we see in infants, we see in anthropology, we see in the animal kingdom, and that is an act of demonstrating compassion when we see a need or suffering in another individual. Our philosophy here at the Food Bank is that we serve the entire community, both those with resources and those without. We're wanting to make sure both are living their best life and and I think compassion holds it all together. It's it's when someone's selfless and sharing and caring or when someone's in need and, and is humble and, and receiving. Um, those two things come together here at the food bank and, and we witness that miracle of compassion every day. You have to understand sort of human nature of, of people. We are, we are we are sometimes happy, we are sometimes mean, we are sometimes impatient, and hardest thing to do is, is not to work with the people, uh, but to work with the systems that oftentimes we have to take so much of a leap of faith that they will respond and support uh, people who may be having the best day, the worst day. That's what makes uh, compassion within systems so critical and vital for their success. Compassion in USA is a six-part learning journey designed to teach self-compassion and community well-being that honors our common humanity and affirms the beauty of our differences. Join a people-centered campaign committed to creating compassionate cities. The journey starts with you. The journey continues with us. Compassionate USA. You'll see this card on your tables. There should be one on every seat. The QR code will take you to the Compassionate USA website where you can find free videos, micro courses, and toolkits and resources to share and implement this at no cost, a catalyst for change. So now, I invite every one of you to join in this people-centered campaign. On behalf of our children and future generations of our nation, please, Pledge to become a Compassionate USA partner. Put your city on a compassionate map. Together, I'm confident that we will possess the power to fundamentally and foundationally reshape the trajectory of our nation. So thank you to my fellow mayors, leaders, and friends for choosing a better path for our communities. God bless you all. Ed's final words to me as I, go up, as I came up, he goes, go up there, it's on there, trust us. Of course I trust you, Ed. It's the fourth time we do this together. Now, I'd like to introduce you to a government relations associate who serves on the Sourcewell legal team. He brings a wealth of knowledge and strategy to Sourcewell, as well as a deep background in policy analysis and public relations. Please welcome Bill Otto to the podium. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Sourcewell is pleased to be with you at this year's annual conference of mayors. Sourcewell is a joint purchasing organization that serves cities throughout the country with cooperative procurement contracts. Our contracts afford cities the luxury of not having to facilitate an independent RFP process, which saves them time and money. And because we do this on a national scale, we are able to obtain for you savings upwards of 50% off of what you would on an independent RFP. Our purchasing tool is available to all of you at no cost and, while you and all the while you satisfy your local and state procurement rules. We're also very proud to say that we are the procurement arm of the Climate Mayor's Electric Vehicle Purchasing Collaborative by providing contracts to help transition governments to electric fleets. Speaking of, I'd like to enlist your support for legislation currently moving through Congress to make it easier for all of your cities to purchase transit vehicles through FTA dollars, an initiative for which you will be the greatest benefactor. In just the past two years, 
Sourceful has helped nearly 10,000 cities across the country make 250,000 procurements totaling almost $4 billion, all in government purchases through our contracts, a real testament to the value that cooperative purchasing provides your cities. And while we work uh, in all states and in cities everywhere, I would be remiss if I did not give a special shout out to the mayors here today from our home state of Minnesota. I'd like to offer a special thank you to uh, USCM past president, Mayor Kotz of Burnsville, Mayor Winston of Brooklyn Park, Edina Mayor Jim Hovland, Minneapolis's Jacob Fry, Minnetonka Mayor Brad Wearsome, Ron Case of Eden, Eden Prairie, and Rochester's mayor and my former colleague in the Minnesota legislature, Kim Norton. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to Mr. Cochran. And thank you to our outgoing and incoming presidents of the conference. We're pleased to partner with all of you. We're pleased to partner with the conference. And we look forward to providing all of your city's cooperative purchasing solutions into the future. Thank you. those things up quick this is I think the last panel that I'm introducing oh and they didn't get see look they didn't get the prompter right here let's go where's the prompter prompter am I supposed to be there this doesn't look like the right place do you want me to just start reading from there purchasing solutions to help save time and money and ensure efficient steward ah ah you see I was right prompter's not on the right place let me tell you, the prompter guy's done a phenomenal job. He really has. And the beauty of it, yeah, we can clap for the prompter guy. And what's exciting about seeing him in the hallways is when he's going in the opposite direction, I know I'm not needed. So it's very good. And actually, it's very reassuring. I guess he was not on cue because in fairness to him, they were bringing out the chairs and I got a little ahead of myself. Maybe Ed sent me out early. But since this is my last panel that I introduce, you know. Um, maybe they wanted me to come up here and ad lib for a little bit. It's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. And it's been honestly the greatest honor of my career to serve my brother and sister mayors in this incredible organization led by incredible people like Tom. I think I see Elizabeth over there. I think I see Tom's wife over there. Ageless, ageless, incredible. Tom, you're getting older, but she's not. You're driving little buggies, she's not. Be careful, buddy. It's my pleasure to bring our vice president to the stage. She's a powerful voice on the mental health and behavioral health challenges facing our cities. We've spent a lot of time on this this weekend, guys, because we really, really understand the power of this issue. During this next panel discussion, she, along with her guest, will delve deeper into how we got here and what some groups are doing nationally and locally to address this priority. Please welcome our next president, Reno Mayor Hillary Sheevy. What time did you go to bed last night? <laughs> Be honest. Oh yeah, you, you've been up all night. There's Tom. <laughs> okay, well I am very um, excited to have this next conversation. Obviously, it's a huge um, issue. It's something I care very deeply about. I know all, many of you do too, and hits a lot of us personally. Um, I'm excited to call out um, someone who I know very well, and his name is Steve Schell. He um, heads up the Behavioral Health and Addiction Institute in Reno, Nevada. We've worked together the last 10 years. He goes all over the country and opens up behavioral health hospitals. Please welcome Steve Schell. Come on out. It's feeling like a game show. Come on, Steve. Next, we have Jennifer Snow. She is from NAMI the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Come on out. Thank you for being here. And next up, Dr. Kenneth Rosenberg from Will Cornell Medical Center in New York. Come on out. And he's a Peabody Award winner 
And documentary, I, in, your documentary is incredible, so I can't wait for them to see the little clip. Thank you. Um, can I just say, I don't fangirl over anyone, I fangirl over you. He changed my life. I read um, something in the LA Times that you did, and it absolutely changed my life forever. So this is the first time that I got to meet you, and um, what, a, what an honor. So I can't wait to work with you for the next year on um, some really, really important work that we're gonna do on mental health. Okay, so Steve, let's just get to it, because this is gonna be like the Cliff Notes version. We're, <laughs> we're gonna get on and off. So um, let's talk a little bit about, um, you open up behavioral health hospitals all over. You've done this. And so we decided to open up a 24-7 crisis center in Reno. And kind of tell me, how long has it taken us? At least five years. Wow. Okay. Give us, tell and, me why. And it started with your vision. So we were talking about five years ago about how to build a system of care in the Reno community. And you realized we did not have a walk-in center that was operating 24-7. We had individuals landing in the emergency rooms and in the jails. So it really started from your passion for mental health and talking with community partners about what our community really needed. Yeah, so what's the big issue? Why did it take so long? So really the red tape with our state government. So. Oh, imagine that. <laughs> not to offend our state of yeah. Nevada. No, we have to work with them too, so. We are repurposing a state building that has been sitting vacant for, for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so that's the space we're gonna be occupying. And then through the ARPA dollars, we were able to get funding to renovate the space and then also provide operating expenses. But it's taken us at least five years to work through that whole process. Because we've also had to work with the county, which has also been challenging. And I, I, I said this at the White House and I learned my lesson because I was in, in front of everyone that in the room was from the county. And I said, cities are 24 seven, counties are nine to five. Oh, <laughs> that did not go over well. <laughs> I was not popular, let's say. <laughs> but I will say if the funding had gone to you directly as the mayor of our community, we would already be open and operating today. So well, I think I mayors do it fast and frequent, right? Yes. And then here's the other thing that I was saying, let's just be honest, like politically, I think the difference is a lot of people don't know their, who their county commission is, but they know their mayor and they're gonna hold you accountable. So mayors have to, they have to think quick and move, right? So you know your constituents better than anyone. Mm -hmm. And so it really has to start at the mayor's level. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Jennifer, tell us about NAMI. A lot of people probably don't know what NAMI is and what NAMI does. Yes, why, well, Mayor, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and having NAMI at the table. I'm just curious, people in the audience, who's heard of NAMI connected yeah, raise to your, your hand. local community? Oh, bless That's your great. hearts. I'm so excited to see that. Uh, the, the number of you are already aware. So we are the National Alliance on Mental Illness, for those who didn't raise their hands, or NAMI. We are the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization, and we're dedicated to improving the lives of people with mental health conditions through advocacy, education, support, and public awareness. I have the honor to work in NAMI's national office in DC where I focus on policy, but we have state organizations in 49 states and local NAMIs in over 600 communities who are on the ground doing God's work every day, helping people in crisis, connecting people with education programs, with support groups, really trying to be a connector between the policy and the people on the ground. And we are honored to be here today. And for those of you who didn't raise your hand, I encourage you to reach out and find your local NAMI because they can be a resource for you and your constituents. Yeah, you guys are doing some great work. So we look forward, because we're going to come and get you know, I'm going to hold you to that. Right? OK. Yes. So Tom Cochran's over there. We're going to hold you to it. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, um, Wonderful. OK, Dr. Rosenberg, like I said, I just, I, when they told me that you were going to be our guest, I could not, I honestly couldn't believe it. Um, yeah, such, a, such a massive fan. When I talk about mental health, too, I know, you know, people will say, like, let's exercise and, you know, hope and positivity, all that stuff. I'm talking about, like, the severe, severe illness that we're seeing. You and I, we had an in-depth conversation in the back, and I said, you know, I've heard a lot, and I'm sure many of you mayors hear it. People are saying, you know, we're seeing more violence 
with people on our streets, right? And then I said, do you think that's because medications or drugs, street drugs are so much stronger and we're talking about that. And then we're talking about just, you know, allowing people to die on our streets. That's what we're doing. So tell about, talk about your documentary, but talk about your work and what you're doing. Cause like, I think you, out of anyone that I've ever spoken to on this topic, you get it the best. That's so kind. I mean, I'm a psychiatrist. I make films because you know, it's a way that I can educate the public about a problem that we face as family members, that we all face, as Nami has pointed out, one in four, one in five families have someone who has a severe mental illness. It's really the neglected crisis, uh, and I think one of the greatest social crises of our time. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the back, and it's worth repeating because you, you, you brought it up. I think the underappreciated part of that is the substance abuse problem. Uh, you know, mental illness uh, is, is quite terrible, but when it's fueled by substance abuse, I think that accounts for the fact that 25% that of people in jails and prisons and at least 25% of people on the streets, at, at the very least, are there languishing because, uh, because they have a substance abuse problem. And when you talk to people on the front lines in the crisis centers, so forth and so on, they say at least half, if not 80%, of people with serious mental illness have a co-occurring substance abuse disorder. So I think substance abuse, we could talk about it more after you show the clip, I think is a really underappreciated element of mental illness, which is literally taking people's lives. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a clip. Can we run that clip? sister was taken to were far from ideal, but they provided necessary care. In the 1950s, there were 558,000 patients in America's asylums. By the time I finished my training as a psychiatrist, 40 years later, over 90% of those beds were lost. The psychiatric hospital where I had just trained was demolished. Like most of my peers, I went into private practice. And like most of the graduating psychiatrists, I did not treat the seriously mentally ill. Twenty years later, I wanted to understand why this happened in my profession. I spoke to eight past presidents of the American Psychiatric Association and ask them how our country and our profession came to neglect our neediest patients. The movement from state hospitals to community to jails and prisons is probably the saddest part of the story of 20th century and early 21st century American psychiatry. That they threw everybody out of hospitals in the 70s. You know, that was the mistake for people who need custodial care for their whole lives. And we didn't, we didn't even think of that. I organized a conference at the association's annual meeting and so many other illnesses about the role of psychiatry in this crisis. And I have yet to find a single county in the United States where there are as many seriously mentally ill people in the county mental health facility as there are in the county jail. If anyone knows anyone... I invited Dr. Fuller Torrey. America's preeminent expert on serious mental illness. During my practicing lifetime, most psychiatrists have not spent very much time taking care of people with severe mental illness. And I will say that quite frankly, I have not been uh, proud of my own profession over the years. I think in order to understand the disaster that we're looking at today, you really have to start in the early 1800s. The jails and what they call the poor houses at that time, there was an increasing number of people who today we would say have serious mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. And people like Dorothea Dix and others said, it's really inhumane to leave these people in jail. It's not where they belong. So let's put them in mental hospitals. So then over the next hundred years, the hospitals kept being built and built and built. 
The states pay 96, 97 percent of all the costs of people who are severely mentally ill. The federal government had almost no money in the system at all. There was a huge incentive for the states to close down these hospitals because they effectively shifted the cost of the care of these people from the state government to the federal government. As soon as Kennedy became president, he both speeded up the emptying of the hospitals and he created seven to 800 community mental health centers around the United States to try and prevent the development of future cases without paying any attention to the people who were already sick and the people who were coming out of the hospitals. Once the people were in the community, then they became the fiscal responsibility of the federal government. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Mr. Nixon will present Governor Reagan. During the 1970s, both Nixon and then Reagan had no understanding of mental illness. When Reagan took office, he stopped the federal funds that were going directly to the community mental health centers. The excessive growth of government bureaucracy and government spending. So what Reagan was saying was the feds should not really be involved in this. Let's give it back to the states. The states, of course, they didn't want it back. There's not any single Ronald Reagan to blame for it all. There's 10 presidents since 1960 who were all responsible for it. State governors, state legislatures, everyone's responsible for it. This is a 150-year-old disaster that has ended up being really the largest social disaster of the 20th century and now the 21st century. California had been the canary in the coal mine from day one because they were at the forefront of emptying out their hospitals. So today we are seeing problems in the emergency rooms as we're seeing them everywhere, but you see them worse in California where there are almost literally no state hospital beds left. Let's not clean anything up. The emergency rooms are overrun with the people with severe mental illness. Wow. Look how young you were in there. So handsome. <laughs> <laughs> no, the you know, films about that. take how a long, long time to make. How long did that take you? And they age you enormously. It, of course, it's are stressful. But you won a Peabody Award for that. I did. And you've won a whole bunch of awards. Yeah. But how long has it taken you to? So that really, that film we started thinking about, I mean, that, that interview I did at, at the American Psychiatric Association was 2011. You know, so that's why I started thinking about it. We started in earnest making the film in 15, but I wanted to go back to really talk about the history. Most of the film is what we call in filmmaking verite, cinema verite, uh, profiles of people and their families and what their lives are like over the course of three to five years, because I think that way you really see what happens. But I thought it was important to have some historical context, and that's what this is, including historical context of me as a younger man. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, but I think, too, people do believe today that there are state hospitals that take care of these individuals. Do you believe that? That people, that's what I am finding, that people are shocked when I tell them there is no place for them. So we are allowing them to die on our streets. I think that is incredibly inhumane. I think that's absolutely correct. We're letting people languish on the streets and die in the jails. Die, die on the streets. Um, even if you get someone to a hospital, you can't keep them there against their will with the current laws for more than three days, I mean, without some really, you know, ex extreme process. And there's a whole, you know, philosophy, something called assisted outpatient treatment and mental health courts that tries to divert people away from the jails, but most people end up ja in jails on the streets. My sister, who was, you know, lower middle class, lived on the streets for a period of time. Uh, and it's not an uncommon phenomena, you know, and, and now more than ever, now more than ever. Mm -hmm. How much do you think politics plays a role here? Because we were talking about it because I really believe, because there's this whole thing about like a 72 hour hold, 
if someone is having a crisis, we typically see them in the ERs, and then they get released early, and they're usually, I mean, they can be very suicidal, they can be dangerous, those types of things. And I do think some of that needs to be mandatory, but then it can be very unpopular, political. Give me yes. your thoughts there. Oh, it was extremely polarizing. In New York, Mayor Adams came out and talked about assisted outpatient treatment. And even before he got to you know, the second sentence, there was a storm of criticism around it. And, and it creates lots of controversy for good reason. You're taking away people's civil liberties and you're saying we as the state, we as doctors, we as judges have decided that what you have is not an alternative lifestyle, but it's an illness and it's something that really needs to be treated. Mm -hmm. You know, that's very controversial. On the other hand, as many mothers will tell you, they've watched their children die with their civil liberties intact. And that's a terrible thing as a family member, mm -hmm. as unfortunately we may even know ourselves, you know, to watch someone pass away because you had no way to get them help. Mm -hmm. And then it's also the only health care crisis that we send police officers to instead of physicians. Occupies 10% of their Crazy, time. Right? So that needs a whole restructure. Um, and, and remember, cities are where we feel it the most, in our jails, in our ERs, um, our first responders. And we aren't getting them the help. And that's also causing a whole other sort of mental health stressor that we don't talk about as well. So, I mean, there's so many components, but the one I'm so passionate about is the most severe, the ones that we see on the streets every single day that we truly just walk over. So, okay, to wrap this up, because like I said, this is the Cliff Note version, and we're, we'll do a lot more this year, because I can't really, I can't wait to dive in, because we're really going to get to the root of the problem. It's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard, but we're going to say it, because mayors are the ones on the front line, and, and together we can move uh, America. So I'm going to ask you, Steve, you have the ear of America's mayors. What do we need to do? What, tell, tell me what the prescription needs to be. I, I think, know it's a big, broad question, but all of you. I think first and foremost, mayors have to sit down with community leaders and community partners, just like you've done, and not because you're sitting here, but I think you really have to understand what's going on in your community, identify the gaps in services, do the research on what's happening to your constituents, and then build a plan from there. Where we really need mayor's help at the moment is with our workforce. We have a lot of individuals that are not working in the behavioral health profession. So we're starting a workforce development center in Nevada where we will be going into high schools to encourage students to choose a career in the behavioral health professions. So I think it starts there as well. We also need help with the payers, working with the insurance companies to ensure that they are authorizing the care that individuals need. We still have insurance companies that are expecting us to work miracles in a matter of days when so many individuals need longer treatment. So I think it starts there as well. And we have the Department of Labor here, so see us right when we walk off stage, because they're doing some great work, so Wonderful. we're gonna get connected. What would you say? You know, I, I really appreciate that you raise that only in a mental health crisis is the responder usually a cop with a gun. If, if someone's having a heart attack, a, a, prof a healthcare professional responds. We strongly believe that people who are in mental health crisis deserve a mental health response. We have the new 988 number to easily connect everyone to a, a trained counselor at the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. That is a huge step in the right direction, but it's only one pillar of a full crisis response system. We need the mobile crisis teams so that when someone needs more than just de-escalation on the phone, that you have a trained mental health professional who can respond either individually or in, in conjunction with, with the, the law enforcement response. We also need those crisis stabilization facilities for people who cannot be de-escalated on the scene by mobile crisis so that you don't cycle through the jails, you don't languish in an ER where you get no mental health services, but that you're able to stabilize, get connected to care, and, and hopefully you know, improve your overall all, all well-being and not continue to cycle through the same process. Dr. Rosenberg. Uh, well, I think, you know, clearly serious mental illness and, sub and substance abuse, these are treatable illnesses. They may not be curable always, but they're certainly treatable. And we have imperfect but very good treatments available. What do we need to do? Uh, frankly, I think we need to do exactly what you're doing. You know, I mean, w yeah. everyone has someone who has a mental health problem in their lives. 50% of us need psychiatric care in our, in our, in our own lives but rarely do we ever speak about that. And I think that 
I don't know if you're finding this, but I, am, I think the public's very responsive to that. They're like, this is our story, and it's about time we took care of it. Because if you look at funding for uh, the National Institute of Health, you find a fraction of the funding is for our sickest patients. The cancer, cardiac disease, I mean, these are terrible illnesses, granted, but mental illness, severe mental illness, gets a small fraction of the amount that these other diseases get. So why do you I, think that is the stigma? I think it's stigma, but I think that, and I, I think it's largely because it's everything that, that you all are trying to combat, and especially by talking about it. And I imagine the voters are responding to that, frankly. I think they are right now. I'm hearing it more and more mm -hmm. that they're really starting to see it. And I hate to say this, this like pains me to say this. Three to five years, I don't see it getting better. What do you, what do you think? I, I mean, I know that's a horrible thing to say, but and we're going to have to wrap it up, but tell me what you think. What does this look like? I think it's getting better, frankly. I think it's getting incrementally better. Um, I think the problems that are there of poverty, housing, of substance abuse, which is the fuel, uh, in my opinion, of you know, what we're seeing in the streets, uh, those problems aren't getting better, but I think awareness because of the work that you all are doing, frankly, yeah. awareness is really changing. Yeah. And I do think, like you said, I mean, I do think we have a drug crisis in this country and we need to start talking about it and addressing it. That seems to be also a big stigma too. Yeah. We, you know, don't talk about that, but we better, right? Well, thank you so much for being here and I can't wait to work with all of you through this next year. And <clears throat> seriously, I have so much respect for what you're doing and we'll keep after it. So thanks everyone. All right, we're going this way. So this is it, guys, my last hurrah. I want to say thank you to all of you. I want to thank, yes, thank you. I want to thank Tom, I want to thank Ed, Bernsey, everybody in the back, the entire staff of the U.S. Conference of Mayors that have basically lifted me up on eagle's wings and helped me fly high and shine and uh, given me a platform. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And thanks to all of you, the sponsors, the business community, um, the elected officials. Uh, this is the best support group in America uh, for mayors and uh, the one that gets it done. So thank you all. God bless you. And uh, and they, now they want me to talk about tonight. So I'm gonna talk about tonight. Uh, and there's a special event, which is the Space Around Us, the Center of Science and Industry, COSI. This event recognizes the balance between Columbus's technological advancements and the thriving foliage around the city. The session is now concluded. Enjoy the rest of your meeting today. <laughs>